joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we have a very um, important guest today, I think, and very timely as well. Uh, this is Dr. Robert Peter Gale. Uh, he's uh, basically known as one of the world's top specialists on cancer immunology and radiation. And he was with us just a few days ago when he arrived in Japan. But uh, now he has uh, been up to the Fukushima area and he's seen the situation uh, there on location and he's communicated with a number of Japanese uh, government officials about uh, what's going on. So here he's going to give us sort of his after action report on uh, what's, uh, what, what he's seen and what his assessment of the situation is there. Uh, just to uh, remind you who he is, he is the uh, visiting professor in the hematology division of the Department of Experimental Medicine of the Imperial College in London. Uh, and uh, a couple of things I'd like to say about uh, the organization. He expects to speak for about uh, 10 minutes at the start to basically update us on uh, what has changed and what he's learned uh, since last time he visited us a few days ago. And uh, then we'll have a rather long um, Q&A session, which will give us a chance to uh, deal with the issues we want to know about, uh, especially nowadays when we're all learning about micro sieverts and things which uh, we never knew about two or three weeks ago. Uh, this is a man who has a lot of the answers to our questions. And uh, at the end of this uh, session, uh, we'll be ending somewhere between 10.30 and 10.45. Uh, he has to leave uh, very strictly to his next appointment. As you might imagine, he's in great demand right now. So uh, at the end, uh, please excuse me if I'm a little rough in closing the session uh, and uh, letting uh, Dr. Gale move on to his next point. All right, well, thank you much, and please uh, give a warm hand to Dr. Gale. We usually don't get a, a, applause from press people, so I appreciate that. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm happy to say that I'm a, I'm a member of this club, CART, for my last year. But it was uh, most kind of you to invite me back. Um, I just I thought I could be brief since I've, I've been here recently. Um, I, I thought I might start though with just with an anecdote about um, this is a, a story that um, happened in the Soviet Union about in 1924. Um, Armin Hammer, some of you will know, have been an industrialist. So our major contact with the Soviet Union during the uh, Cold War years. Um, Armin Hammer was also a physician, and um, he, he bought a field hospital and went to the Ural Mountains in 1924 to, uh, because there was a typhus epidemic, and he, um, he went there to help Russian children who were dying of typhus, and uh, Lenin, um, it was bad times in the Soviet Union. The uh, economic system was collapsing. And Lenin heard that there was this American in, uh, in the Ural Mountains who was uh, helping Soviet children. And he asked to, uh, Hammer to come down to the Kremlin. And he asked him what he's doing. And he said, well, Mr. Lenin, you know, Russian children are dying of uh, typhus. And I, I came here on the doctor. And Lenin, you know, looked him over and he said, we don't need doctors, we need tractors. Um, meaning that Soviet Union, or Russia at that time, had plenty of highly qualified physicians, and they needed other things. Now, I kind of see my, uh, my role here in somewhat the same light, in the sense that there are a, a huge number of highly trained um, Japanese physicians, um, many of some of whom have trained with me, others elsewhere. They have you know, excellent skills when it comes to dealing with radiological injuries. And um, what's really lacking, in my opinion, is some clear understanding um, on the part of the public of what are the radiation risks involved um, with this accident. The, um, since I was here, just to update, um, I've had two meetings in the Prime Minister's office with um, uh, Deputy, Deputy Cabinet Secretary Fukuyama discussing these issues. 
um, in both instances I've been accompanied by, by Japanese colleagues. Um, I've, well, all of us, not just me, but the, the, this group of um, physicians have responded in writing to a series of queries posed by the, um, by the Prime Minister's office that fundamentally relate to radiation risk, and things of that nature, trying to give them a handle on, on our assessment of the situation. And, uh, and finally, uh, I've been up to Fukuyama, uh, Fukushima, I'm sorry, been up to Fukushima um, to the J camp, which is the, the staging area, all of you know better than me, for the uh, recovery effort. And I have up there with uh, members of the um, uh, Nuclear um, Fuels Transport Agency, and with, um, more importantly, I've met with the physicians who are responsible for the health care of the workers. Um, and, and so, so that's the interim update. Um, and I think it might be you know, most efficient if I was to to stop speaking and just begin to answer questions. Okay, well that was an even quicker introduction than I expected. So uh, let's open it up to questions right away. We'll start with the working press. Uh, just raise your hand and of course, uh, before you uh, ask a question, uh, please identify yourself and uh, then we'll start. So, working press, questions. Okay, this gentleman here in front. <coughs> Uh, hello, my name is Ken Yoshino at Fuji TV in Tokyo. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my question is that, uh, uh, is there anything Japan, Japanese government and electric company could have done or should have done but didn't do uh, right after the, the, the problem was discovered in Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactors? You know, that's a very expansive question because I'm sure all of you have either read or written articles about whether the, the plant was appropriately cited, whether the um, possibility of a tsunami was you know, considered. So there's some fundamental issues. Um, but I'm, I'm probably best and safest if I confine myself to issues that are in my area of expertise, you know, which is the preparedness for um, uh, radiation injuries on one hand, uh, and on the second hand, the um, how to handle public understanding of, what, of all of these data. I mean, on, on the first hand, you know, are there reasonable preparations to deal with radiation acting victims? I think there are. I mean, they are no better or worse coordinated than um, many other countries. I mean, for example, in the United States, we have a consortium of um, experts at different hospitals that are prepared to, um, that, that are in a network that can be mobilized to provide care to radiation <coughs> victims. I'm talking about very high level care, tertiary level care. Um, the European Union has exactly the same system in place. Um, and it was mobilized uh, at the time of this accident uh, so as to be able to provide assistance. And I think that a very comparable but not identical situation exists in Japan. Um, but I have to say that having been in um, a number of these accidents or events, that um, what looks good on paper is actually extremely far from reality. The notion that people who have gotten high doses of radiation um, are going to be put on airplanes and flown around the, the globe, you know, to, or even around the country, it just doesn't happen. It, it's, a, it's a huge effort that is very, very unlikely to play out um, in reality. And the care of these people is going to be regional. Um, so I think you know preparations are in place. Fortunately, they haven't. Need, needed to be activated. You know, as you know, only a few superficial injuries from radiation so far, but um, it remains to be seen. I know that um, 
is the Japanese Association of Transplant uh, Centers that is activated and so forth and so on. I, I'll come back to it later, but there, we have considerable debate uh, over what might be done to um, anticipate workers getting high radiation exposures. We could probably come back to that. But on the on the second issue, um, I don't think proper attention has been given by any government, not only by the Japanese government to the transmission of information um, to the public about what these radiation hazards mean. Um, I, we've argued, a number of us have argued for a number of years that, uh, and I spoke about it last time, that um, governments and, and uh, agencies of governments release these figures like Becquerel's per liter of seawater or uh, cesium levels in spinach. There is no effort made to translate this into something that the public can, can appreciate and comprehend and modify their behavior. And to me, this is a glaring omission, but it's not unique to the Japanese uh, government. And the main function of my meetings with Mr. Fukuyama and his colleagues in the Prime Minister's office was to try to establish a uh, a small council of advisors um, that could be an interface between all of these data and the public. And um, I know that the government is debating that. Um, it would be composed predominantly of Japanese physicians and scientists and um, would help out in this, uh, I think, huge gap we have. Um, so that's a long answer to a brief question. Thank you very much. Okay, go ahead. Hello, Rick Wallace from the Australian newspaper. Uh, Dr. Gale, last time you were here, I think you spoke a lot about the effect of radioactive iodine on the human body. Just wondering if you could give us a little bit more information on the effect of radioactive cesium on the human body and tell us if there are any, any other. Um, uh, isotopes that we need to be aware of that pose some risk in the fallout from this plan? Yes. So, um, two, two species of radioactive cesium, 134 and 137, are released uh, by the fissioning of the nuclear fuels and um, have been released at this accident, although in much lower quantities than radioactive iodine and in uh, extraordinarily low quantities than, for example, at the Chernobyl accident. Um, the, the major issue with cesium, um, as compared with radioactive iodine, is that um, its half-life, as, as I'm sure all of you know by now, one year as a radiobiology expert, is 30 years and not eight days. So if we um, consider the physical half-life of cesium, it's 300 years. You know, we generally say 10 half lives um, are enough to get rid of get rid of something. But I, this is a good example of the failure to communicate uh, effectively with the public, um, or maybe even to understand the, the implications. The the biological half life of cesium, which is you eat cesium, how how long does it remain in you? Well, if that's shorter than the physical half, well, it is going to be shorter because we're not going to be around 300 years. So it's how cesium is handled in the body is more important in this particular instance than the physical half-life. So cesium you know, mimics some of the chemicals in the body and it's, it's, it, um, it goes out relative quickly compared to its um, physical half-life so that in several months or certainly in a year and not 300 years, any cesium you would ingest is gone. And there are some things that, that we can do as an intervention to encourage um, the, the exit of radioactive cesium because it's handled by sodium by the body. 
So uh, there are various um, chelating agents or agents that bind things that have been proposed. I'm not convinced they're effective, but um, we, we had an accident in Brazil where people ate season, radioactive cesium, and uh, they became radioactive. Um, so that's, that's another difference. Um, when people incorporate a lot of cesium, internally, they can actually become radioactive, and then they can pose a hazard to the people taking care of them. So the patients in Brazil had to be, the, the doctors, uh, at least in our initial thinking, the doctors you know, had to be protected. They had, they are the ones who had to be shielded. Of course, you know, when you have very sick people, this notion goes down the tubes immediately. And um, so we just keep pregnant nurses and physicians away from patients. But uh, the short biological, or relatively short biological half-life does not help out when we consider the physical half-life in terms of, for example, ground contamination. Okay, there we're actually dealing with even, I would say, a more complex situation because we have the physical half-life of the radionuclide, but we have the, the movement through the, um, the environment that is, uh, it's, you know, it, it is deposited on soil and on, on plants and things of that nature. And the, the transit of that through the environment then determines its health risks to humans, especially if it enters the water supply the water table, things like that. So it, it's very complicated. I mean, I think a detailed discussion is really beyond my expertise. But, but um, it has, I think at the moment, radiocesium is not, is more of an environmental hazard than it is a human health hazard, um, except for its deposition on you know, leafy vegetables and, and things of like that, which may contribute to the total radiation exposure.